Okay. Some ground rules and expectations as we get started. Um, this call is designed as all calls for IOI as a place of learning and conversation. And so we ask that participants come and be curious, ask for clarifications, ask deep questions, challenge our thinking. It's, it's how we all move this work forward together. Um, hold space for others and be curious about others' perspectives. Um, hold space for them to ask questions and contribute. And then also be respectful. We're here to build community, not tear it down. And we know that there are often you know, different perspectives. That's one of the things that makes these conversations so robust and so fruitful and help us you know, expand the work that we're doing. Um, but we ask that you do that with um, respect for others. Jerry's also going to be dropping in our code of conduct. If something happens, please feel free to reach out to myself, um, either through private message. There's also means in the code of conduct if something happens um, that you need to uh, surface throughout the, the means of this call. Thank you, Jerry, for sharing that. As we get started, I wanted to give a bit of a high level overview for our work at IOI and then lead into what led to the creation of the State of Open Infrastructure Report, um, which is the anchor for the grants data conversation that we're, we're gonna be having today. Um, IOI was started back in 2020 formally, but prior to that as a coalition of individuals that were really aligned with and also frustrated with the problem of how we better sustain the core infrastructure and the open infrastructure in particular that powers research and scholarship. Um, and so IOI was created out of those conversations to think more creatively and also with you know, research base and evidence base to start to think about where we strategically could work to increase the investment in and the adoption of open infrastructure, recognizing that we believe that open infrastructure is really fundamental, not only in terms of how it represents the community's needs, but also all of the other benefits of the transparency, the ability to build upon that work, the ability to have interoperability in different ways uh, that open infrastructure affords in the broader ecosystem. We do this in a couple of ways, particularly at IOI. So I mentioned that, you know, and you'll see the State of Open Infrastructure Report is very much a sneak peek uh, or a look under the hood, if you want to use a car metaphor, of the research that the team across, not just the research team, but the whole organization are doing on a day-to-day -day basis to help build out our understanding to power our work and how we do that in the broader ecosystem. And so we employ a research driven approach. We try to challenge some of the assumptions, whether it's how historically things have been funded or the infrastructures that might be dominant in a space, um, who gets to participate um, so that it can guide our strategies and our action to um, help move our mission forward. We provide these resources and analysis openly available to the broader public uh, through things like the State of Open Infrastructure Report, InfraFinder, other tools and reports that we generate um, for specific targeted analysis to help funders, budget holders, and infrastructure providers assess, evaluate, inform their strategies so they can make different decisions about how to move forward. Um, again, moving open infrastructure to be the default for research and scholarship. And then lastly, we put those pieces of work into action in various ways. Um, we pilot solutions from funding pilots and other means of helping to catalyze additional resources in the space, both strategic resources as well as funding and capital, um, but also working to apply some of those learnings to specific infrastructures, helping them build the critical capacity to move their work forward, as well as working with other organizations that are seeking assistance in doing some of the due diligence or implementing some of these strategies so that they too can become uh, more entrenched adopters and supporters of infrastructure and building the sustainability of the sector through those ways. Now, I'm going to get into a little bit about that State of Open Infrastructure Report. Um, we had this initial idea as, you know, IOI since 2020 has been not only engaging in a deep way with various stakeholders in the community, especially around open science, open research, open scholarship. And so looking at not only institutional stakeholders, those that might be represented across consortia or networks of institutions or research performing organizations, 
national research and education networks, regional research education networks, but also IOI sitting at that intersection of the institutional and, and research community funders and interpreting that quite broadly. Um, we'll give a little bit more of a boundary around how we're thinking of funders for our grants data set, but really thinking of who can financially contribute to supporting these, uh, these infrastructures and the broader ecosystem change that's needed. In addition to also thinking about where we can support the needs of the infrastructure providers themselves. Um, and so since 2020, we've not only been working to deeply engage with those communities to better understand not only where IOI can be additive, but what those needs are, what those trends are, where are their information gaps, what is necessary to really drive the change that we talk about in terms of moving infrastructure forward in a way that it can be more holistically sustained over longer periods of time in less brittle fashion. And so moving forward over the past two years, thinking about what does it look like to bring together not only that case making of why we view open infrastructure as a necessary and critical component to do that work and to achieve that vision, but also where we could start to surface some of the information that we knew was coming up in conversations individually with these various stakeholders that could help maybe lift all boats. And so we thought of um, this compilation and that's where the state of open infrastructure idea was born. Um, the 2024 state of open infrastructure report was released this past May and our senior researcher Gail Steinhardt will be talking more about that. Um, so I will leave kind of the deeper part of that to her. But our report objectives really were to um, cover a couple of key areas. So one, raise the profile of open infrastructure. How can we not only increase the visibility, the understanding, help move this beyond the usual suspect crowd um, and or help to reinforce the work that we know many of our institutional colleagues and colleagues in the funding landscape are doing to try to get more resourcing in a more um, longstanding way dedicated towards these critical infrastructures. Illuminate patterns in funding, we'll be digging into that today. Um, establish a baseline of information that we can build upon. Uh, investigate selected topics, um, we'll talk a little bit more about that and also identify possible courses of action. There's a number of contributors here that are, uh, and we've got, we're very lucky to have some of them on the call, including Cameron and Carl uh, and Gail, of course. Um, this work was generously supported by the Mellon Foundation and Arcadia Fund, and also supported by smaller contributions from our sustaining circle members who are not only representatives of uh, institutional and university consortia, but also institutions themselves um, whose support is really critical to bolstering our capacity to do this sort of transformational work. I mentioned before that we wanted to dig into a number of different topics. Um, and I encourage you all, if you haven't already taken a look at the report to do so, maybe after this call, um, in it, you'll find a lot of really juicy uh, analysis and interesting findings. So um, for the state of, today or for the timing of today, we're gonna to be digging into the grant funding portion, uh, which Gail will be talking more about, but you'll also be able to find um, information and analysis on 57 infrastructures that we have been deeply engaging with and conducting research alongside with and for that are represented in a tool that we have called InfraFinder. Um, in State of Open Infrastructure, we've got an analysis of uh, those characteristics of those select open infrastructures to see where there might be some interesting findings and trends that we can learn from. We also dig into governance, trends in performance and adoption. There's a regional policy um, development section, which also will be augmented by, in the coming weeks, a deeper policy analysis around the state of open infrastructure policy and things that are affecting open infrastructure adoption across four major continents. Um, influence of procurement, IT governance, and future signals. And so just to note that this is one piece in a bigger picture. Also that the report is the first of hopefully an annual instrument that we are building out. And so if there's something here that you, you would like to see or something that you're not seeing that you would like to see, please do let us know. Authors of the report and those that are involved, we are 
thrilled to be joined by, and we'll have a panel after Gail does a walkthrough through some of the findings. Um, Gail Steinhardt, who's our senior researcher at IOI and really the driving force of this report. Um, Gail is has worked extensively, not only in environmental research before becoming a librarian, she's been involved with the Data One community, the archive leadership team, managing Cornell's institutional repository, um, and also prior to joining IOI was an IT project manager at Atmire, um, a company that provides the DSpace repository services to clients around the world. Um, very briefly, Cameron Nayland uh, is a friend to IOI. He was part of the initial conversations and coalition that led to the creation of IOI. He is a professor and co-lead of the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative, also known as Koki. Um, Koki, uh, which Carl and Cameron um, both work for, they have been a driving force for our data analysis, knowing how, how gnarly and overwhelming grants data can be at the scale that we were investigating. It's been a critical support there, which I'll talk more about. Um, but Cameron has been um, working on this space, and I'll let him talk a little bit more about that when we get to our panel, um, for quite a long time, not only as a, a senior scientist for the Science and Technology Facilities Council in the UK, um, working for the Public Library of Science. Um, he's been behind the Barcelona Declaration, principles of open scholarly infrastructure, and more. Um, it would take a long time for me to go through all the different things Cameron's done in this space. Um, and I know him from even the blogging space, which tells you how long ago that might have been. So RIP Google Reader. Um, <laughs> Carl is a statistical analyst and data scientist for Koki. Um, and his research focuses on developing and identifying models and methods for analyzing differences, patterns, and correlations in bibliometric data. Um, and that's a, a really key part of the work that Koki does, but just also just a, a sample of the broader amounts of data that they bring together so they can help inform the broader space. Um, Carl's a mathematical st statistician that came off, rolled off the tongue by training and has a strong track record of, of publications that look at in probability statistics and financial risk modeling. And then last but certainly not least, uh, we are joined by John Moore, who is the Chief in Information Officer for Information Technology at the MacArthur Foundation, um, where he oversees foundation-wide technology services and planning. Um, and is also an infrastructure geek like the rest of us um, and is responsible for building out a strong and sustainable information technology infrastructure for the foundation. Um, prior to joining MacArthur as well in 2012, John also worked in as the director of academic systems at the University of Chicago. So he knows what it also means to have this infrastructure sustained within an institutional setting as well. Um, and in addition to that, as if John doesn't have enough on his plate, he's also the co-director of the Philanthropy da Data Commons, which is a shared sector-wide governance and techn technical infrastructure that works to foster trust and enable new ways of managing data and information in this space as a sector-wide asset, um, creating more possibilities in our collective work and spurring more equitable access to resources in philanthropy. Um, we'll be going through a facilitated uh, question and answer session and also questions from the audience uh, after a short presentation from our colleague Gail, and we'll be talking more with our panelists there. But for now, Gail, Think, turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Thanks. Um, good to be here this morning, my time or whatever your time is. Uh, just by way of background, IOI has taken a look at grant funding for open infrastructure before, and we really wanted to try to extend and update that work. This is made a little bit challenging by the fact that there's not a single comprehensive and open source of grant award data that we could use. Uh, so we needed to assemble it ourselves. And um, in order to do that, we really, we had to set sort of a scope for this activity as well as finding some entry points, which I think will become evident when I uh, talk about our methods, which are on the next slide. You can switch, thanks, Caitlin. Um, so what we chose to do was focus on the infrastructures in InfraFinder, which Caitlin mentioned. That's our tool that helps users discover and compare open infrastructures. And we chose to do this because we have all this additional information in InfraFinder that we've collected about those infrastructures, and then we can combine that knowledge uh, with what we learn about their grant funding. 
by limiting the universe of infrastructures that we're looking at, we also limit the, the number of funders that we need to take into consideration. So we um, revisited the original grants data set that we compiled. We also asked participating infrastructures in InfraFinder, what are your main sources of funding? And so we extended the funder list that way, put them in priority order and just started working our way down the list. In terms of sources of data, we decided to use funder data as the source of truth. So we would scrape their websites or harvest their databases, whatever we could get our hands on, supplemented with a little bit of additional data from open air. So we pulled down all of the data that we could, uh, used names of open infrastructures and their variants to search that mass of data and come up with a, a data set of plausible awards. So we searched recipient title and abstract or description in those awards. Um, that was quite a chunk of data that then we had to review for relevance and duplicates. And so we, we removed false positives and duplicated that data. And from there, we decided to categorize each award according to the type of activity that was being funded on the basis of what we could discern by reading the abstract. So it's a little bit subjective, but I'll give you an example of what we're able to do with that. Uh, we did a con currency conversion to US dollars so we could add things up and make comparisons. Uh, we also added from InfraFinder the solution category for each infrastructure. So is it a publishing platform? Is it a standard or protocol? What kind of thing is receiving this funding? Not only which specific thing is receiving this funding. And uh, we built a dashboard. So uh, you should feel free to explore the data on your own using the dashboard. You can also download the entire data set from Zenodo. And I can't wait to see what other people um, are able to do with this data set. I'm just gonna to touch on a few of the questions that we decided to ask. So next slide, please. Um, I described you know, the boundaries of the data set. So even with those um, limitations, I guess, I'm still, I think we're all still quite pleased at what we're able to assemble here. The data set we've built so far consists of more than 500 awards from 23 funders to 36 infrastructures, totaling more than $400 million. We broke the, that out to some meta categories, but these are just the totals in, in gold. So I think we're, we're happy with this. These are non-trivial sums and counts. Um, next slide, please, Caitlin. In terms of those meta categories, the uh, direct awards are awards that actually go straight to an infrastructure, infrastructure community or team. That's the red segment here. About 42% of the funding in our data set constitutes direct support to infrastructure. As we were reviewing the rewards for relevance, um, we started to notice lots of infrastructures are mentioned in the abstract or description in awards that are going someplace else. Uh, so rather than toss that out as not relevant, that 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 looked interesting, and I'll show you what we did with that. Um, so we kept it, but that's the blue segment. More than half of the funding is actually involving open infrastructure in some way, but not necessarily supporting it directly. There's a much smaller category I won't talk about today, but there are some awards made to support adoption of a particular infrastructure uh, and a few that we are unable to categorize. Next slide, please. So I, I, I expect people to want to know who are the biggest recipients, who are the biggest funders. So we'll get, we'll get some of this out of the way. And then I think dive into to what I think are more interesting questions that you can look at with the data. But in terms of top recipients, on the left, we have the top recipients by total amount of funding that they've received it, according to the data that we've compiled. On the right, total uh, top recipients by the number of awards. And I guess what is maybe interesting here is that there are some infrastructures that are successful in attracting a few very large awards. There are some that are um, successful more at attracting a lot of smaller awards. That's Omeka and Mercurtu on the right-hand table. And there are some that are able to manage uh, both. Uh, and a, a few such as Europe PMC and Open Science Framework that do a, a really good job of attracting sustained ongoing support from a, key, a few key funders. All right, next please. Okay, here's the indirect support, the beginning of the indirect support story. This thing we did not set out to investigate but discovered along the way and decided to dig into a little bit. Um, as I said, 
awards that name an open infrastructure in the description, but don't actually go to that infrastructure, we categorized as indirect. And then we further broke those out into use or end use awards and, and something ter uh, I'll term adjacent. For use, we're thinking about end user of an open infrastructure. And these are sample quotes from the uh, award descriptions for uh, this type of award. So examples of this are, a researcher who intends to upload all their preprints to archive or all their data to dry it or to apply Creative Commons licenses to all their outputs. If I could have the next slide. Adjacent awards uh, are somewhat more substantive than these end uses. So say someone is building a new application on top of existing infrastructure, maybe a new interface, an alternate interface for archive or an application that relies on the existence of some standard or protocol to, to run or to have material to run. Or uh, if the infrastructure is also providing content, open content in some way, maybe someone is, is using the entire corpus of that infrastructure to do research. Uh, so these are research and development activities that are utterly dependent on the existence of the open infrastructure not necessarily working in collaboration with that community, or may, they might be, um, and as far as we can tell, not necessarily directly funding that community. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, these are the top re recipients of awards we've labeled, I mean, they're not recipients, sorry. These are the top infrastructures named in awards we've classified as indirect uh, by count of award. I just want to pause to say I'm sure that these indirect these the, these instances of naming an open infrastructure in the abstract are a vast undercount of that kind of activity. I would expect to see. Uh, I was actually kind of surprised to see that pop up in such an important part of real estate in a grant proposal. I would expect to see a lot more of that in the in the proposal narrative or in a data management and sharing plan. Um, so I'm sure that actually we're really undercounting. Uh, these kinds of awards. Nevertheless, there's still more of them and they add up to more funding that goes to the infrastructures directly. So why is why am I dwelling here? Why is that interesting? The po point of open infrastructure is it is for it to be used. And I can imagine a scenario where an institution makes heavy use of something like archive. And so they decide to become a supporting member and financially support that open infrastructure. But that that doesn't have to happen. So we're curious about what all this use might signal for the sustainability of open infrastructure. It's also maybe, or I guess I'm asking the question, is this also a potentially useful and interesting signal of the impact of open infrastructure that, that these infrastructures enable so much funding in the research and scholarship landscape uh, without necessarily receiving direct support. Maybe they do, maybe maybe they don't, but we're underestimating. I'm sure we're underestimating this kind of award. Next slide, please. Okay, back to the top recipients and funders. Um, these are the top funders according to awards we've classified as direct on the left, uh, and then uh, funders that are uh, issuing awards that are indirect, so using but not necessarily directly supporting an infrastructure on the right. And something that I think might be sort of interesting to look at here is whether direct support for an infrastructure is also aligned with the funder's support for use of it. And in this case, European Commission and Welcome are very generous funders of open infrastructure. So they're at the top of the list on the left-hand table highlighted in kind of an aqua green. And then they also are funding a lot of awards to um, research activities that are using these infrastructures. So they appear on both sides. Uh, slightly potentially different story around the United States National Science Foundation, also a very generous funder of open infrastructure, uh, highlighted in gold on the left and on the right. Even more generous in awards to folks who are using that infrastructure is that um, should there be some like, uh, I don't know, greater alignment or sense of proportion there than we see? I don't know. I don't really want to draw strong quantitative conclusions about this with, uh, you know, given the size and extent of the data set. But these are the kinds of questions we can continue to explore as we improve and expand our data collection. 
Next slide, please. Okay, shifting gears. I think this is the last one I have for my uh, greatest hits from the funding section, but um, shifting gears to talk about how we can use information from InfraFinder in combination with the funding data to uh, ask questions. So on the left, um, I mentioned earlier that we categorized grant awards according to the type of activity that, that they fund as far as we could tell from the description. And so in terms of direct awards to open infrastructure, about two thirds of the funding in the data set is supporting research and development. That's the orange part of the donut on the left. Uh, and with operations coming in behind that at just under 20%. We also asked infrastructures participating in InfraFinder, what's your greatest uh, funding need right now? And that was a free text answer. We coded those using the same categories that we used for the grants data. And about half of them say their most pressing need is operational. This isn't maybe a, sur a surprise if you're uh, if you subscribe to the conventional wisdom that philanthropy prefers to fund innovation and operations. But um, I guess I take it as a, a comforting that the data support that uh, pattern. Uh, but we are seeing from talking to infrastructures that, and literally talking to infrastructures that participate in InfraFinder that there is this pretty significant unmet need for operational support. So I will stop there and hand it back over to Caitlin. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna stop sharing because that goes to the back end of there. Thank you, Gail, for kicking us off with that information and also that um, sort of refresher on the grants data. And I will also note that and we can drop the link back into the chat. All of this data that we've pulled together is an open data set that's made available. And also the Koki team has worked with us to help also create a dashboard so that you can get in there and play with that data as well. Um, but now I want to take the remainder of our time to turn it over to our broader panel, uh, Gail, Cameron, Carl, and John, uh, to have a discussion about the um, not only these findings, but the broader kind of state of funding data and where there's opportunities for learning and collaboration and maybe some actions we can collectively take forward together. And so um, in terms of kicking this off, first off, if anybody has, thank you, Gail, for putting that in the chat. If anybody has questions, please feel free to drop those into the Zoom chat or into our shared notes document. Um, but just to start, uh, would love to start, and I might start with, I know Carl and uh, Cameron have been very deeply embedded in this data as well as Gail. But I might start with you, John, um, knowing that the Philanthropy Data Commons um, is looking at a couple different adjacent areas mm -hmm. to this in terms of pulling together information uh, and also knowing that you wear a double hat of operating within a funding organization itself. Um, but I'm curious, you know, what this, brings up for you in terms of some of the trends that you've seen within philanthropy and some of the work that I know you're looking to seek to um, provide different approaches and solutions to with the Philanthropy Data Commons initiative as well. Yeah, um, I, there was a few themes that, that jumped out. Um, just real quick, an overview of the Philanthropy Data Commons for um, some who may not be familiar. So it's an initiative started by MacArthur, but includes funders and other um, important actors in the sectors, and I mean, most significantly um, change-making organizations uh, or, or nonprofits, uh, as well as data platform providers and grants management providers. Um, and, and so we're connecting um, systems and players in the sector to share data um, with the intent of increasing the ability to um, get grants in a um, less onerous way and hopefully increase the um, possibilities of getting granting from related funders. Um, a couple trends that that I saw, you know, something I hear when we talk about infrastructure is like, well, there isn't enough money for it. Um, it's expensive. But, you know, the research here shows, you know, $400 million, which is a significant amount of funding. I mean, so the money is there. Um, I note um, the percentage of indirect funding. So I think often maybe it's not the lead in a conversation or a grant, but it's embedded. And, and I would say, you know, technology is pervasive. I mean, I think about that in our work at the foundation, that it's a part and parcel of everything we do. Um, the other thing 
that I see is that I would say sort of EU-based funders are um, more active, and I, I would say taking the lead. And, and in our work and research, I've seen that there's an awareness, a greater awareness and understanding that data is an asset to the sector and should be treated, you know, as such. And I think that's manifested both in terms of, um, you know, privacy regulation in the EU. And, and, and then, um, you know, I, 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 the other thing I, I noted with interest was about governance, and, and that's an important part of, of infrastructure as well. And um, with the philanthropy data commons, we've just gone through a process to create um, governance, and, and we, we've opted for the advisory board. So I, I, I see a lot of um, things that both look familiar and, um, and, and somewhat validating, both good and bad. And, and the bad is that you know, this is a thorny issue for the sector, and I think we all need to work together to collectively solve it and, and move forward. And it's not a, a simple um, situation, which is perhaps why we're all still plugging away at it. So those are some of my initial thoughts. No, that's a, those are great points, John. And I think the the sort of where we can identify that there is, and knowing that this is a, a small drop in the bucket, for the amount of funding that we know goes into research infrastructure globally uh, and the sort of intractable problem of trying to gather all of that information and have it all represented. I might turn it to Cameron and Carl um, and I'll let you decide who wants to chime in first about this. But um, in terms of that data collection and the data parsing, right? Knowing that as much as we may hope that funder data is all in one uniform set and has an open infrastructure tag that makes this analysis super duper easy to like search across. And if you could tell us a little bit more about what you experienced there and, and what maybe an ideal future state might be to make having an insight into this information more possible, that would be great. Cameron, you want to kick yeah. us off? Or Carl, go ahead. Thanks, Kagan. Um, yeah, so we worked through the, well, there's a whole bunch of different data that we worked with in, in the process. And um, if you read through the report, you probably, you'll, you'll get a feel of um, the level of complexity and, and the challenges that we had in working with different data. And there are different types of data that we worked with. Um, some we have to have to scrape and then some had to download and others are, well, another one, the open air was the, uh, the database that we worked with. So each of those are dealt with differently. And as you can imagine, um, across the data, things are in different formats, um, different things are recorded in different ways. And so th and, um, that means a lot of different type of data challenges. Um, and some are really interesting ones, like uh, when we search for names, uh, we, we realize some of the names uh, are really hard to work with in, in terms of searching because you get a whole bunch of things that are not really related in what you wanted. Um, so a lot of interesting problems. Some of them are probably expected, but others not so much. Uh, and I think what, uh, what, uh, well, the, the whole process shows is that, um, and, and, and this, I think in the part of the report as well, uh, as one of the conclusions mentioned that uh, good data doesn't come easy. <laughs> And um, so, but 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 uh, this what this work demonstrated is that um, what is possible, um, something that maybe is informative, powerful, and potentially scalable. And I think working through this process, we uh, we get a feel of what things um, could be done better and what things we can um, scale easily, and some of the things that we maybe have to. Uh, put some more effort in as a, as a community maybe um, to make the data easier to work with and, and, and easier to join together maybe in, in a way that um, it becomes much more useful uh, for, the, for the broader community. Yeah. Um, Carl, are there any specific examples that come to mind about where like where you hit that those points of friction? I know we've talked about, and I know John is also immersed in this, but for those that are 
maybe less less uh, embedded in trying to get the information, like the raw data that you can pull from the, I think most of us here have probably gone to like a foundation website and looked at where there's grants information and some provide that in a way that you can just download, others you kind of have to take some different approaches, but is there like a little bit more texture you might be able to provide just to give an example of like how some of that can uh, manifest? So just to give an example of one of the major steps in putting the data together, we had to uh, write SQL queries uh, for each of the of the data set, um, and then transform them into a way that is unified or standardized across all the data, and therefore combine them into one data set. And that could be things like date um, that has been recorded in all different formats. Uh, one of the interesting ones I showed Cameron was that one of the dates was one of them had dates recorded in seconds, so <laughs> trillions of seconds <laughs> rather than an actual date. Um, so we had to do all that type of conversion into something that we think uh, we can work with and have it done in a uniform way across all the different data. Thank you, Carl. Cameron, anything you want to build on uh, Carl's remarks? Yeah, like I, th I think one of the um, so I think two things two things really struck me. Um, and apologies for the background noise there's a lot of rain going on for those coming counting along at home i'm up to 34.1 millimeters at this point um the um two things really struck me one was the the smart approach of focusing down on a set of 57 infrastructures um because that meant we could do this searching but as carl said it was a painful text searching by name uh, please don't call your infrastructure core because everyone else calls things core and it's really hard to find um but at the same token, with the focus, we, and Gail mentioned this, there was a reasonable amount of deduplication. We found the same grants more than once. And that's a good sign, right? That means we aren't doing a terrible job of starting to get some coverage of the space for those organisations and for these funders. Um, the flip side of it, many of these organisations are organisations that provide and work with persistent identifiers to uniquely identify organisations or people or objects. And our problem was that such persistent identifiers were not being applied to the organisations or people or objects engaged in this process. So I think there's a a real opportunity. I mean, we, Carl and I have been working on two projects in parallel. One was was this one where this was the real challenge of, you know, which core are we talking about? Because there's a, a core facility for bioinformatics at the University of Manchester, which is not the core which provides open access information and is a project out of the Open University in the UK. Um, so um, that's been a real challenge in this project. And this other project where we were basically being asked can you tell us about all the collaborations in the world on the basis of who's co-authoring with who? And the data sets we have for doing that today are fabulous and amazing. And we can go from the DOIs on the outputs to the raw identifiers for the organisations. We can look at the types. We can look at where we are. We can build maps. And we can do this over sets of 140 million objects, whereas um, here we were struggling a bit um, to be able to tease apart. And, and Gail did a heroic amount of work manually going through disambiguating cleaning up. Uh, I want to call out for David Riordan, who also did heroic work doing the actual scraping um, of some of this from, from grant um, websites. So my one plea in all of this really is, could we apply the tools of the infrastructures that we're talking about funding to make it easier to find out about the funding of the infrastructures because the possibilities are massive. We saw glimpses of what was possible when we touched on these good, well, well covered areas of metadata. And then, but it was single cases and case studies. And there's lots of interesting things in there, but we could see that we weren't getting the whole picture. Um, and, but it would be really interesting to scale up, and do that better. If I could just tag on to that, just um, implicit in what Cameron said, but I just want to say it explicitly. One of the challenges is that uh, work, the work of building and sustaining these infrastructures that earns grants doesn't necessarily result in publications and all of the, a lot of the work around 
using persistent identifiers on research on research outputs is focused on an output that may be absent when you're talking about infrastructure. So just wanted to make that clear. No, that's great. Um, I do want to get to uh, Ella's question in the chat. So bear with me as I as I read this out. Thank you so much for the interesting research. I'm one of the developers of the Public Utility Data Liberation Project. What a great name. That's a great name for a project, which publishes free, clean, and open source US electricity data. In line with your findings, long-term operations and maintenance funding is a persistent challenge for us. You mentioned that though indirect funding often references open infrastructure, it may not necessarily translate into actually funding that infrastructure. Do you have suggestions on strategies for open infrastructure providers to more actively work with downstream users to fund ongoing operations and maintenance of OI? I might go. Is that the obvious um, thing? And work, with, work with IOI. <laughs> <laughs> IOI is doing some fabulous work on identifying those kinds of ways of tracking who the downstream users are. And um, and yeah, so in the scholarly space, um, I think there are lots of opportunities to do that better. And we're starting to see um, some of the referencing and, and, and things that might help us get a better view of the scale of use and whether that use is connected to organizations doing the funding or not. Um, I think the bigger picture it, in areas like electricity data, I wouldn't even know where to start, but I suspect that's the kind of thing that um, the IOI folks have certainly put some thought into. Yeah. I'd be curious, John, if there's anything that comes to mind on your end in terms of, and this might be either a philanthropy data commons hat, knowing that you're in conversation with a number of others that are pulling together information to think about different approaches to philanthropy, or possibly even with them, Carther hat, um, in terms of that shift towards recognizing that operations and maintenance expenditure for some of these infrastructures and the need to have support go towards that in addition to you know, the innovative, more development-based funding. Yeah. Um, and I'm... <laughs> Multi-million dollar question. I know. In an interesting your way. <laughs> Maybe wearing two and a half hats. So the sure. Philanthropy Data Commons hat, you know, says, or, or, or the response there, I think, would be how can the PDC help, um, I don't know, promote I don't know if I'd go as far as require, but the use of open infrastructure. Um, and um, so then me as a CIO is thinking, well, you know, as a purchaser of services and user, you know, can I require or um, select organizations that favor um, open infrastructure um, as a funder, which, you know, and I'm in, in a funder, but I'm not a, a grant maker, proper, um, but we do, you know, with grants talk about, um, you know, I think both capacity and concerns about cybersecurity, um, but I could see, and I think this is a valid <laughs> perspective, that we make grants and require, you know, the usage of open infrastructure as part of that where, where applicable um, you know, so that it, instead of a, oh, and this, you know, have that be in, um, in I don't know, at, at the front or earlier in the conversations, you know, and it's thinking a little bit about the AI space where MacArthur does make grants, you know, the concern of both closed systems and biases, you know, really comes up. And so having that open access and I don't know integrity of of the data and perhaps of the the um uh per, I don't want to say performers the the actors in in the system I think you know is is another way to help and I I think to the extent that funders in general um both aware are aware and support this would be a a good thing and I and I feel like that awareness is is increasing. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. um, and also just noting in the chat here as well, my colleague Catherine has put in, and I think Ella, this is, you know, we are always looking for sources of inspiration, knowing that, 
you know, for many of us that have been working on these challenges in research or in scholarship, you know, we need to look for fresh approaches or from parallels. And so thinking of knowledge as a uh, utility, we've, um, Catherine has dropped in a piece of work that our team did a couple of years ago, just to look at like, how do you sustain say water and sanitation, like what lessons can we learn from looking at, or electricity, things that you don't want to be disruptive or lose grant funding and shut down and uh, have that be like the negative impact that it has on the communities that most rely on it. And so it's a, it's a great question and I think an area we need to continue to work towards. Um, I'm conscious of time. And so unless someone has an additional question, I'm going to check our shared note stock as well. Um, I might move towards thinking about some next steps before we formally wrap up and close. Um, Gail, do you want to kick us off in terms of what's coming up or like where you're most excited about building on this? And then we can go to those comments from the rest of our panelists before we wrap. Um, sure. So for State of Open 2025, just at a very nuts and bolts level, we aim to double the number of participants in InfraFinder. So that will double the number of infrastructures that we can possibly look into. Um, now that we've got some experience with these processes, we'd also like to try and roughly double the number of funders uh, under consideration. This is kind of doing things as we've done them. I think we would really like to explore some other ways of, of approaching, collecting, and handling the data. So for example, we're using the names of infrastructures because it's not like you can search this massive data for open infrastructure and get the stuff that we're looking for. So you know, are there natural language processing techniques or something that we could do to cast a wider net um, with that data? Or uh, another thing we're sort of interested in uh, is are there are there interesting changes in funders' interests over time that could be detected in the data that we assemble? Again, probably using uh, natural language processing techniques, something like that. Um, yeah, I, I think you know we're sort of stuck in this in-between time of wanting to continue to explore the questions and build out the data set that we have while we lobby for, collaborate on, the much bigger and better data set that we really need. <laughs> so yeah, that's where I think this is headed. Oh, one more thing, just thinking about the last bit of conversation. You know, this is only looking at grant funding, which is not the only revenue stream that infrastructures have. And, um, you know, I, I we made a little bit of an effort to try to situate the, that in some kind of context. But again, there's a data problem because the financial reporting requirements vary by what's the type of organization is behind the thing and what are the reporting requirements in that jurisdiction so that data can be really um, scarce and hard to come by. But it would be really nice to be able to sort of look at the fuller picture and, and ask like, what is the proper place of philanthropy in the overall financial picture for open infrastructure? And a call for if anyone has information on those data sets or would like to collaborate, please do let us know. Um, Cameron, Carl, and John, any closing remarks before we move to wrap? Yeah, so I can say just as the sort of, I guess, the, the data nerd and the researcher, um, a real plea, any funders on the call, please engage in the Crossref Funder Registry. Register your grants um, in a place where we can get them in a consistent metadata schema with identifiers. That would be lovely and very helpful. Um, and yeah, I think to echo what you were just saying, KB, um, I would be, we are very interested in the question of building out stronger systems for uh, funder data in general. It is a gap in the open metadata ecosystem at the moment. I know other people are also working on parts of this. So really interested to hear on what people think is working well, what could work better, whether opportunities for collaboration. Um, and with that, I think we could make a significant jump in scale of what we've been able to do here and the depth that we'd be able to probe into the detail of what's going on and the tool chains are just as Gail's alluding to changing day by day so there will be more more to more to see perfect carl and john i guess just adding to what cameron's saying so it would be great if everything is in one, in one place and we can work from one database that has all the information. Um, but obviously, uh, acknowledging that, you know, it might be difficult to have all that happen in, in very quickly, immediately. 
Um, in the meantime, we would really love to see more identifiers in existing databases, um, um, identifiers for all the different pieces and linking all those identifiers together would be, would be really great. Thank you, Carl. John, anything closing? Yeah, I um, well, I just want to say that I'm super excited about, I mean, both the the report and and what feels to me like a a, a focus of of energy on this, and you know, having worked in the sector for now more than a decade and on the PDC initiative for more than a couple of years, I, I feel like uh, you know, this is a long haul, and one of the reasons we don't have better infrastructure is because it's not easy to do, but there's a lot of efforts going on to, you know, I guess, create and, and add the capabilities and, and put that into place for the sector. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of the ways we work are a bit dated. And, and so having these assets and capabilities is both important and, you know, it's more than time for that to happen. So I'm both encouraged and, and also feel the urgency, right? Because the sooner we have better tools and data in place and in use, it's gonna help the sector. Well, with that, I'm gonna go to wrap as quickly as I can. A huge thank you to our panelists. I know that there's um, information that you can contact us. I know John has also put more information about how to contact and be part of the Philanthropy Data Commons as well, which I'm super inspired by. Um, this is going to be shared, the recording and our notes and slides. Um, before we close, we have a quick poll, so team, make it live. Um, also to note that our next community conversation on this uh, on the State of Open Infrastructure Report will be September 19th. Um, so you got a little bit of a break and it'll be digging into the regional policy uh, analysis that the team has done looking at North America, Latin America, Africa, and Europe. Um, you won't want to miss it. It is an immense amount of work there too. Um, while we are going through this. I know my colleagues will be putting in registration links for that. We will also be sharing out um, through our State of Open Infrastructure newsletter additional updates throughout the rest of the Northern Hemisphere summer. If you'd like to stay up to date on that, please join us. And um, I hope that you have a wonderful rest of the day. Um, this is such an important piece of work, and we're just very lucky to have you all here for this conversation. Thanks so much. And I'll leave this up here just in case anyone is Thank still. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, John and Cameron and Carl and Caitlin and Jerry, and everybody. Great job, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great rest of your night, gang. <laughs> yep, we will. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yes.